Hello and welcome to this Sultan Brain Hub video. I'm Ollie and today I'm going to be taking you through brain herniations. Before we jump into this, it's important to learn a little about the normal physiology. The pressure inside the cranial vault is called the intracranial pressure. The normal range for this is between 5 and 15 millimetres of mercury. To adequately perfuse the brain, the mean arterial pressure must be greater than the intracranial pressure. When the mean arterial pressure is less than that of the intracranial pressure, a reflex called the central nervous system ischemic response is initiated. Now we're going to move on to talk about pathological states where the intracranial pressure is higher than it would normally be. If there is edema, bleeding or a space occupying lesion in the brain, this will take up additional space in the cranial cavity. This will raise the intracranial pressure unless compensation can occur. This can happen by shunting blood and or CSF out of the cranial cavity to offset this additional pressure. Once these compensatory mechanisms have been exhausted, the intracranial pressure will increase above that of the mean arterial pressure. And this is when brain shunts called herniations can occur. Now we're ready to move on to talk about brain herniations themselves. When the mean arterial pressure is lower than that of the intracranial pressure, this will trigger the central nervous system ischemic response that was mentioned earlier. The hypothalamus activates the sympathetic nervous system, which causes peripheral vasoconstriction and an increase in cardiac output as a means to increase the mean arterial pressure. With this attempt to increase the mean arterial pressure will eventually stimulate the baroreceptors located in the carotid body since these detect stretch in blood vessel walls and this will consequently lead to a dramatic reduction in heart rate. The end result of uncontrolled intracranial pressure will be brain herniation. Within this, brain tissue will shift from its normal position inside the skull these can be classified according to the location of the herniation. To orientate yourself, here we have a brain showing the six different types of herniation, with a variety of pathologies present on the image that can lead to this. The first type of herniation is indicated by the number one, and this is uncle herniation. Uncle herniation is a common type of transtentorial herniation where part of the temporal lobe, called the uncus, can be squeezed so much that it moves towards the tentorum cerebelli and puts pressure onto the midbrain. The next type of herniation shown, indicated by arrow 2, is called central herniation. This is when the diencephalon and parts of both temporal lobes are pushed through a notch within the tentorum cerebelli. Downward herniation in this manner can stretch the basilar artery and can cause it to tear, leading to a particular type of subarachnoid bleed called a direct hemorrhage. Arrow 3 indicates a subfalcine herniation. This is the most common type of brain herniation, and it occurs when the innermost part of the frontal lobe is pushed under part of the falc cerebri. This doesn't put as much pressure on the brain stem as other herniations, but it may interfere with blood flow in the anterior cerebral artery. If you look where arrow 4 is pointing, you can see an example of transcalvarial herniation, which is when the brain squeezes through a defect within the skull. This defect could be a fracture or a surgical site, and is actually what may happen during a craniectomy. Arrow 5 indicates an upward transtentorial herniation. This occurs when there is increased pressure in the posterior fossa, which pushes the cerebellum up through the notch of the tentorium cerebelli. Finally, arrow 6 is demonstrating tonsillar herniation. This is when the cerebellar tonsils move down through the foramen magnum, possibly causing compression of the medulla and upper cervical spinal cord. This increased pressure on the brainstem can result in dysfunction of the centres responsible for controlling respiratory and cardiac function. Now, to finish off, we're going to go through a few of the symptoms of brain herniation. 
One of the symptoms you can get is a dilated pupil due to compression of the parasympathetic supply provided by the ocular motor nerve. Patients often complain of headache due to the increase in intracranial pressure and as time goes on, patients often become drowsy. Whilst taking observations, a phenomenon known as Cushing's triad may be noted, which consists of severely elevated blood pressure, irregular breathing and bradycardia. This is often seen in response to raised intracranial pressure in head injuries, although it is worth noting that this can also be seen in response to recent administration of IV adrenaline or similar catecholamines. As the brain herniation worsens, you can get loss of consciousness and coma due to damage to the reticular activating system located within the brainstem. On neurological examination, you may find that there are a loss of reflexes and the patient may report a history of difficulty concentrating. Finally, many patients with brain herniations go on to have seizures, along with displaying decorticate and decerebrate posturing. As a result of these symptoms, along with compression of the respiratory and cardiac centres in the medulla, brain herniations often lead to severe disability and death. Consequently, it is important to have a high degree of clinical suspicion in patients displaying a collection of these symptoms or a rapidly falling Glasgow Coma score. Often, by the time herniations are visible on CT scan, the likelihood of meaningful neurological recovery is poor. As such, any suspected herniation should be rapidly reviewed by a neurosurgical team since the treatment is the removal of the etiologic mass and decompressive craniectomy. Find us on Facebook, Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel to help explain the mysteries of the brain.